Creator God, you call us to pray and work for your kingdom to come on earth as it is on, in heaven. Help us today to understand one way that we can work to do that. Guide us, I pray. Give us wisdom and give us hope. Amen. Amen. So, Jane, I don't think you require any more introduction than I've already given um, and our gratitude for coming. Uh, so the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much, um, Ruth, Barbara, Melanie, for inviting me. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Um, so, yeah, I'll just get on with um, telling you all about the bill. So a little bit about me. Um, my background is um, I've worked for the past 12 years with uh, mainly ecological scientists um, in an arts science collaboration um, on public engagement, really, helping scientists to um, push their messages out on these issues to a wider public audience. So I've worked with um, Dave Goulson from the University of Sussex for a very long time. Dave is one of the contributors to the bill. Um, I've worked with scientists at the University of Oxford, at the University uh, Natural History Museum. Um, and so for a number of years, we've been trying to raise these issues, but it's, you know, along with a lot of NGOs, I've worked with NGOs as well. And of course, it's just not working. It's not working quickly enough. Um, but the great thing is that many, many people now understand that the, these issues are so severe and the impacts that they're likely to have, the climate and ecological emergency. Um, so that puts us in a good place. And so this bill was created to fill the gap in existing legislation and because um, protest and rebellion has a great place but we also need legislation uh, and that is partly what Extinction Rebellion has, has done so, so brilliantly is raise these issues to make the world aware that there is a great need for existing legislation. So I'm going to give you a short presentation about the bill. I'll share my screen. So I hope you can see that. I'm just going to make it bigger. So now I can't see everybody now, but I do hope you can all see that screen and that it's large enough. Um, so we are the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill Alliance. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, we are going through a rebranding session. Um, and so um, we're going to be have a snappier campaign title soon, uh, but we're still the bill is still going to be called the Climate and the Ecological Emergency Bill, so the CEE Bill. Um, so this alliance um, and the bill was launched in August 2020 to persuade the government for the need to act more urgently with stronger legislation, as I've already said, to tackle this emergency. And um, Caroline Lucas tabled the bill in um, September 2020 uh, with um, a bunch of 12 cross-party MPs. So there were 11 co-sponsors. She's the main sponsor at the moment. And um, very quickly, we started building support for it. So now we have... Um, um, policy experts, we are, we're an alliance of scientists, of organisations of all kinds, groups like yourselves, um, so national and local, um, and then councils have come up now, we've got 43 councils now, um, we've got about 119, um, sorry, 109 MPs now, um, there were 14,000, sorry, 1,400 pledges to support the bill from um, candidates at the last election. Um, and we have over 200 organisations, so NGOs, um, businesses, um, groups like yourselves, to about 12,000 grassroots supporters as well at the moment. So the idea is to build 
a very broad based alliance um, from all sections of society to bring support and to persuade more MPs to, for the need for this um, comprehensive legislation. Now, right, my slide wasn't moving down. So, so the top line, the headlines really for the bill is that it's a, a joined up approach to the climate and ecological emergency. So it treats the climate crisis and the um, nature crisis shoulder to shoulder. And it's focusing on urgency, the science, um, firm targets, fairness and accountability are very much embedded. And the bill emphasizes these interconnections all through the, uh, the interconnection of nature with the climate and the, and the natural world. Because if we decarbonize the economy, that is, I mean, that's difficult in, in itself, but in many ways, it's quite straightforward. We know what we need to do. If we do that, if we succeed in doing that in a timely manner, but we don't stop driving, uh, destroying the natural world, we won't have solved the crisis. We won't solve climate change. Um, we won't prevent Earth systems from breaking down. Um, and neither the government nor Parliament are acting with enough urgency at the moment. Um, and our bill plugs hold, holes in existing legislation. So it plugs holes in the Climate Change Act and in the Environment Bill. Um, and it enshrines into law the commitment to reduce emissions to net zero urgently to limit warming to 1.5 in line with our Paris agreements. Because the government's current target and the Climate Change Committee's current target of 2050 is too late. Um, the IPCC now say very clearly that if we succeed in halving emissions uh, within the next 10 years, uh, we do have a chance of re reaching net zero by 2050, but that only, it's only around a 50-50 chance, you know, and that, that, as we say here, that's a toss of a coin. So we don't think, we don't like those odds. And those odds are um, getting worse and worse as day by day. And the IPCC is likely to, reserve, um, to um, revise those targets very soon. So what the bill now says is that um, we need to reach net zero um, with a chance of, with, a, with a 60, at least a 66% chance of reaching, of remaining within 1.5. So that's what our bill now says. So the bill, as I said, the bill tackles fairness. Um, so the UK government in its um, calculation of carbon emissions, it must be fully accountable for all emissions and we're not at the moment. So the Climate Change Act at the moment, the Environment Bill, do not cover aviation and shipping. Um, all we look at in this country at the moment in terms of emissions are um, our own domestic production emissions. Um, now, the government has said that, um, and the Climate Change Committee has, has announced that the, they will be including aviation shipping in, um, in our carbon budgets, but that won't take effect until the sixth carbon budget, and that's not until 2033. So it's a long time off that we'll be including aviation and shipping. So the CE bill accounts for avi aviation and shipping up front. Um, the bill, our bill always also says that the government will be responsible from, for emissions resulting from our entire domestic and international supply chain. So that's an, our entire carbon footprint. So it's not just emissions um, from production at home, it's to do with um, all of our consumption. So everything that we consume and import, we must calculate emissions created by those, those imports. Um, the bill also says that the emissions should be stopped at source. So that means um, stopping 
the, the use of fossil fuels in a timely fashion, um, preventing unproven and potentially damaging negative emissions technologies from being used in the calculation of, of carbon budgets, which is happening at the moment. So a big part of the government's 2050 strategy is the inclusion of technologies um, that are going to mitigate carbon uh, emissions that don't exist yet and could be potentially damaging. Um, so again, um, we must be, in the, in the interest of accountability, we must be fully accountable for the destruction of nature um, and for the UK's part in that. And again, our existing legislation, the Environment Bill, is very inward looking. It concerns itself with England mainly. Um, but the CE bill says that the government will be fully accountable for protection and restoration of UK nature with a focus on biodiversity, soils and natural carbon sinks. So restoration of all ecosystems, terrestrial and the oceans. And that the UK will be responsible for stopping the damage caused to nature by our generated cycles of consumption and trade and production. So this is what I was saying before, that we must be responsible for our consumption um, through goods and services along the supply chains that we use in the UK and internationally. <clears throat> and that includes the extraction of raw materials, deforestation, land degradation, pollution and waste. Um, at the moment, the Environment Bill looks at deforestation um, internationally, but not, it doesn't go into detail about other ecosystems. Um, and the CE Bill also includes regeneration and enhancement of ecosystems. So that's reparation um, where we have caused um, negative impacts. And um, a big part of, the, of, of our, our bill is um, that we feel very strongly that we must bring people with us on that, on this. And that currently um, our party system is polarizing um, and that MPs get stuck um, into the realms of what they believe is possible. And so the bill makes provision for a representative citizens assembly. So that's, um, citizens uh, selected through a process of sortition like a jury, working with scientists and working with the parliament to create a strategy that will meet the bill's objectives, but without undermining, undermining parliamentary sovereignty. Um, so the um, UK Climate Assembly did this very well. Um, they were, it was a very successful outcome, apart from the fact so of course, it's advisory only and it's not going to be made law and very little of it has come to fruition at the moment. Um, but we believe that this, this type of process empower, is capable of empowering MPs to make bolder decisions than they're able to um, uh, during day to day business. Um, and they, that they are given the best evidence. It's bringing part people with them so that they have a real say, as it says here, in shaping the pathways to a fair and just society um, and a fair and just transition. So um, how are we doing that, this? Um, as I said right at the beginning, we're doing it by building a broad alliance from all sections of society. Um, now, at the moment, we have um, the support of eight political parties, or sorry, I should say MPs from eight political parties. Um, six parties support us as parties. Um, the only party that we don't have MPs from at the moment is Conservative Party, but that's, um, we will soon have MPs um, from the Conservative Party. We feel sure of that. Um, we're talking to them all the time. Many of them are very supportive, but feel um, that they find it difficult to support at the moment in the current climate, but the many Labour MPs say the same thing about towing the party line. We've also, so we've got grassroots supporters, um, as I said before, all these different types of organisations, NGOs, businesses, 
uh, councils, faith groups like yourselves, unions, um, regional alliances. So we've started regional alliances. There are about, I think, over 35 regional alliances now, um, all like mini CE bill alliances, um, building relationships with groups and businesses and individuals and councils, just like we are. Um, the first one started in Oxfordshire. It's probably because I come from I come from Oxfordshire, so I was well placed to help get that off the ground. Um, and um, so they're engaging MPs. And I think the unique selling point of this campaign is that these strong alliances are able to engage MPs in a different way. It's not a com combative. Um, engagement it's very much discursive it's very much we want you to come to the table and talk to the community about these issues and we want it to be cross-party we don't want to just talk to my conservative mp or my labor mp we want them both to come together to talk to us um, about where we can meet and where we can seek common ground and and talk reasonably and have a reasoned argument about what the objections are and how we can overcome the objections rather than taking party political um, lines. Um, so we're trying, that's how we're trying to win the argument um, through citizens activism, um, authoritative science and evidence of the bill's economic and social benefits. Thanks. So I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Jane. That was a really, really useful overview. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you a few questions before we um, open this up to, to everybody else. From, from a faith perspective, it is very important, certainly for me, to consider the impact of this legislation, of all legislation, on, uh, on my neighbour. And in this case, my neighbor might be the most vulnerable people both here in the UK and people in the most affected areas, the most affected people. And I was wondering if you could talk to the issues of uh, just transition, the protection of jobs, for instance, and human dignity, uh, and the safeguards for, for poorer people in terms of rising energy costs or the costs of consumer goods and services. Yes, that's right. So. Um... I mean, I think, as I, I probably said before, the bill, if I didn't, the bill doesn't go into detail about how we will, um, how we will do all this in practice. Um, so the process is to have these, uh, the bill presents um, an overarching frame, framework of policy imperatives, really, so that um, people can get together and deliberate, and then the law will be a result, the um, individual bits of legislation will be a result of that. But what the bill does say, and, and I've got a new briefing here that I'll put in the chat so you can all say it, is that any um, measures that are taken to reach the objectives of the bill must not negatively impact vulnerable communities. Um, and that's very much also in terms of any mitigation um, must not negatively impact people's livelihoods or nature, which obviously provides resources. Um, also, um, in terms of resources like uh, water, air, air quality, um, any measures that are taken, and, and also about preserving um, those resources, they, there is a particular focus on human health across the world and um, looking at communities and how these impact, how, it, how the measures are going to impact them. Thank you. And in that context of, of, of looking at vulnerable communities across the globe, could you just explain in, 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 in maybe in, in simple terms why it's unfair for the UK just to count the emissions that we emit in this country? Yeah, well, of course, um, the Paris Agreement um, covers this in quite a lot of detail, and it talks about developed countries. And, and of course, the UK is one of the most developed countries. It's got a history of um, being an industrialised nation. We had an industrial revolution. And so we have a historic, um, more than probably any other country, 
um, we have been in this game of um, creating emissions for longer than many other countries. And so we have a huge obligation um, to um, seek fair transition. And in our carbon budgets, um, the bill says that we must act faster. And so in the Paris Agreement, says that we must act, act faster than any other nation, uh, than, than other nations, not any other nations, but the development nations must act faster. And um, Professor Kevin Anderson, the climate scientist, who is um, one of the contributors to the bill, he says this in, a, in a, one of his latest pay, papers, that the UK, um, looking at the, the current UK budgets and looking at our historic, um, the record of our historic emissions, and the way that we are looking inward, we're only calculating our production emissions, that we should be um, calculating our carbon budgets um, by at least a factor of two. So we you know, we need to be doubling our efforts and we need to act much faster. And so what is the difference between production emissions and consumption emissions? So production emissions, it's a bit of a, nebulous area really, this, this terminology, terminology, but essentially what we produce here domestically is considered our production emissions and our consumption emissions are things that we, we commission, goods and services that we commission that we don't actually uh, physically produce in this country, but they are made elsewhere internationally. Um, like for example, a good example for this is of the food industry. So I specialise in food and farming on the bill team. And uh, the food industry is probably the greatest uh, destroyer of ecological, uh, the, the greatest destroyer of ecosystems globally. And we play a huge part in that in the UK. Because we eat more processed food than any country in Europe, we are punching above our weight in terms of ecological destruction and emissions because we are buying lots of soya, we're buying in lots of palm oil, we, um, we still eat lots of meat. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, you know, we're contributing to those things in a big way. Thank you. And just moving on uh, to a question that often comes up when we talk um, to um, other people about the bill is that it has no chance of success because it doesn't have uh, cross party support in the sense that Conservative MPs in particular um, won't openly support it. And, and um, it's difficult sometimes to get agencies and NGOs to support a bill that they think isn't going to succeed. So I wondered if you had anything to say about that. Yeah, sure. So the bill, it's a private member's bill. And so um, by its very nature, it doesn't have a great chance of being made law in itself as it is at the moment. But um, the, the use of a private member's bill, they are very valuable tools in um, getting uh, issues brought to the forefront and getting MPs attention and the Climate Change Act 2008 was such a private members bill. It was a campaign started by Friends of the Earth called The Big Ask and it's groundbreaking legislation and we were the first in the world to legislate in this way. So the Climate Change to Act 2008 started a life like this and it was exactly the same sort of beast. And the, um, we, we've been inspired by that campaign. Um, the CE bill has been created by some of the people that started that campaign. And it went in exactly the same way. In the beginning, lots of politicians didn't want to support it. They said it's private members bill, it's got no chance. Um, and then gradually, the, um, because of public opinion and world affairs, the campaign um, took hold and it started to gather more and more steam and then politicians could not ignore it and we're in the same situation today even more so because it's a different political landscape now things have changed a lot um, things are much more urgent 
um, politics has changed, po polit positions have become more entrenched. And so the public is even more um, aware of what's going on than they were in, at that time in 2008. Now that campaign took four years to, to um, bring uh, legislation to be successful. And conservative MPs are keen on this bill We've got lots of conservative councillors signed up and, and conservative councils. So for example, um, Oxfordshire County Council, where I live, they're a conservative council. They've signed up to the bill. Um, MPs are talking to us. The, um, the Conservative Environment Network, they're talking to us. Many of them would like to sign up to the bill, but they won't do it until one of them. When one of them does it, the others will follow. Um, but to say that they people, if people say they're not going to support the bill because they don't feel that it's going to succeed because conservatives aren't supporting, or because they think that, for example, the environment bill is the thing to look for to to support, then that's a kind of self fulfilling prophecy. Um, it's 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 not a, it's not a reasoned <laughs> argument really because you, it's about persuasion. And it's about supporting anyway, you know, even if you've even if the environment bill is the thing that people want to support, it doesn't preclude supporting the CE bill. They're mutually complementary. I don't know if that's answered your question. No, that's very useful. In fact, it brings up the, the, the very point that often comes up when we talk to our conservative MPs, um, which is, uh, we don't really need this bill. We've got the environment bill. Why are you focusing on another new piece of legislation? Um, what's the relationship between the CE bill and the environment bill? Yes, so actually um, we have a briefing on the CE bill and um, existing legislation. And I've seen that our good friend Caroline Egan is here and she's helped um, us create this document. Um, and it shows the gaps between um, the existing legislation and, the, and where the CE bill fills them. So the environment bill, as I said before, it's very England centric. It just looks at environment um, law in this country. Um, also at the moment, um, I mean, we are working with NG other NGOs um, trying to strengthen it. And there's a, if you get a chance, I'm going to plug a petition now, the um, Wildlife and Countryside Link have got a fantastic petition. They've got hundreds, I think more than 100,000, they're looking for about 200,000 people to support it, to um, ask for an amendment to add, it's a Hillary Benn amendment, to add a state of nature clause, which says that we will, um, reverse the decline in nature by 2030. And um, this is um, something that Boris Johnson signed up to when he signed the leader's pledge for nature. So it's a UN pledge um, and many developed countries have signed up to this, the leaders have signed up to this. Boris Johnson signed up to it, um, but the Environment Bill does not enshrine that into law. There is no target saying that we will stop the decline, we will reverse the decline in nature by any date at all. And in the Environment Bill, um, we, only, we only have to have one target for um, four categories of um, soil, water, waste. What's the other one, Caroline? <laughs> She's on mute probably, but there are four categories. Um, we only have to have one target for them of at least 15 years. And, and the Secretary of State um, only has to report every five years. You know, you, you, we're looking at this crisis and they, their targets are, we only have to have an update in five years time. And we know that in the last 10 years, we've lost another 30, 20, 30% of abundance of species. So, this is an emergency and our government isn't de dealing with it and they're not not dealing with um they're not dealing with emissions on in um for shipping and aviation they're they're growing sectors and we're not dealing with consumption of our um goods and services thank you jane i'm going to um open 
for, for questions from people who are um, joined the Zoom meeting. But I just want to say that at the end, I'm going to give you five minutes, if that's all right, just to kind of uh, tell us what you think that we might do, what your asks of, of us might be. Um, but if you're ready for it, what, uh, what I'll do is invite questions. Now, um, I did initially say that we wouldn't record the questions, but I've been seeing some of the questions popping up in the chat, and I think they might be very useful to record them. So if, if it's all right with everyone, we will continue the recording. But if you are anxious about your question being on our recording, uh, please stay on at the end and contact us because we'll be able to edit it in some way. Um, so, Ruth, do you think that you could um, help with just looking out for hands? Uh, I, I have to tell everybody every time I do this, I'm on an iPad and I can't see everybody. So. Um, what you could do is maybe just um, stick your hand up if you have got a question. Uh, and I can see that Jim has a question and, and I think he'd pop one in the chat. So go ahead, Jim. Yeah, it's the same questions in the chat, which is how do you help with the, the citizens assembly? How do you- You're a bit quiet, them? Jim. Oh, is that any better? Can yes, you thank you. Is, with the citizens assembly how do you get it to have teeth without undermining parliamentary um sovereignty or whatever it is how, how do you get the citizen assembly to have teeth yeah so i think i got that how do we ensure that the citizens assembly has teeth um well this is this is part of the bill so if mps vote for the bill they're voting for that as much as they're voting for the other clauses that say we must um, act faster and we must um, protect ecosystems at home and abroad. Equally, we must use de deliberative democracy to um, solve this situation, to um, create the laws that are required. So MPs have to agree to that, otherwise we don't have a bill. But, but what would be the difference between the citizens assembly that there has already been which was ignored and how would that how would it be facilitated that it would not be ignored and just as be a, a focus group because the the um climate assembly uk was never intended to become law that wasn't um part of the part of the deal it was just an exercise in pr to be honest to be blunt um, and many the MPs that did it were are absolutely fantastic and they are people who wanted to demonstrate that this works so as far as that goes it was extremely successful it proves that that works and that because lots of people were saying that um, oh people won't know you know people won't be able to tell us um, they're not experts um, you know people can't try to laugh it off as an exercise it was extremely successful um, but it was never intended um, to be part of law. It was never intended to. Um, it was only it, when it's, something starts out as, as advisory, then that's ultimately, ultimately what it will be. But in our bill, um, the act, if it becomes an act, when it becomes an act, uh, will be that those um, deliberations uh, must be part of the law. Melanie, can I um, read out one of the questions, a really tough question, I think, in, in the chat. Is that OK? I'm going to do it. Um, it's from Fleur. And is it? And the question is, to what extent does the bill's focus on accountability cover the responsibility of the UK to climate refugees? Yeah, well, again, um, the bill doesn't go into that, that amount of detail. But it is implied in the way that um, it talks about human health um, and it talks about fairness and accountability. But those sorts of things, that great detail, of course, there's a huge amount to be worked through and the implications. And the reason that we don't go into those details is because we want this to be agreed by 
as many people as possible. If we start putting too much detail in there, there's, there are too many snags and too many reasons for people to say, oh, I'm not going to support that because of this. But if we go for an overarching framework, then we're more likely to succeed and everybody saying, yes, this is a reasonable thing that we can get behind um, and we need to work on this detail. And we need the experts. We're not experts on these things. So for example, next week, um, I'm having a, a meeting with Global Witness. They're the experts. Um, on, they, they have experts and people like yourselves, faith groups who are working um, in these situations and Oxfam, um, who are allies. Um, so this is where, at that stage, that's where that, the detail will be um, sought. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, I dropped out there for a moment. Um, Ruth, I think you must have taken over, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, before I dropped out, there was a really interesting question in the chat about the whole concept of net zero, and, and uh, this ties in with dates for, that, that uh, you're, you were talking about possibly moving in the new iteration of the bill. Could you speak a little bit more about net zero as opposed to absolute zero and what the bill says about that? Yeah, well, the, the bill just follows the line of the Paris Agreement. So it talks about net zero. Now that's that's a very, very interesting concept, uh, net zero. Um, Kevin, Kevin Anderson does not like the term net zero. He says zero is zero. So of course, um, it is a difficult area, um, but we are very unlikely to reach zero without some kind of mitigating factors. So the government's idea of net zero is to mitigate using um, offset. That's quite a big part of the um, environment bill. Offset, you know, incredibly gray area. So for example, planting trees um, and carrying on as bu with business as usual or by um, using negative negative emissions technologies that we don't have working at scale. Uh, biofuels is another one that's a hugely, hugely worrying area. Um, I mean, if we had our, one of our conservationists here, Charlie Gardner, he would go into this in a great deal of detail, but one of them is tree planting. Tree planting sounds good. It's huge worry to have indiscriminate cheap tree planting going on because in this country, um, the government's mantra is tree planting, tree planting. However, from an ecologist and a conservation point of view, we need to know where we're going to produce the trees. How are they going to be grown? Where are they going to be grown? Are they going to be grown in the right area? Are they the right sort of trees? What are the incentives for planting these trees? Are they going to be a risk? In Mexico, the government has a huge program of tree, tree planting and people are clearing forests in order to get permits and money to plant trees. And we know that those trees are not going to start sequestering any carbon for at least 25 years. So this is a huge worry. Um, now we don't, of course, we don't say any of that in the bill. Uh, we don't say that you must reach net zero by doing this and this and this, uh, for the reasons I've said before, because we can't go into that much detail. So all we've got to go on is the only thing in the world at this point in time that the only marker that we have is the Paris Agreement and that's what all nations are really focused on, on, on the IPCC definitions of net, net zero. It's all we've got. So is it right that in effect the bill doesn't uh, address the concept of net or absolute zero, it simply looks at the target temperature? Exactly, yeah. It doesn't go into dates. It simply looks at the target of remaining within 1.5. Uh, and what the Paris Agreement says is um, um, remaining within two degrees with um, attempting to get uh, to remain within 1.5. So that even the Paris Agreement doesn't say we must stop at 1.5. Um, it's trying to do that. And they're very likely to say soon, 
quite soon, I think, that that's not possible anymore. So then we'll have to change the bill again. Thank you. We have a, I can see a hand up from Paul. Was that a cue for me to ask a question? Yes. Okay, yes. great, thank you. Um, yeah, so my question, I, I guess, is around, um, it's mostly around timeline and what can be achieved. Um, uh, you know, the bill is, is three pages long and it's, uh, and it, what it really says is we need a, a proper strategy that includes the things that we've been talking about, right? So, um, you know, it's a, we need to have, within 12 months of this becoming law, we need a strategy that includes consumption footprint, su supply chains and a, a proper way of doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm 100% supportive of all of those things and 100% have you know, huge issues with carbon capture and storage as a, as a thing of, and, uh, and even the concept of nature-based solutions because everyone just seems to think that's a, a magic bullet. So really on board with the whole objectives of the CE bill. I guess what I'm concerned about is, um, you, you know, if it takes, let's say, three or four years to become law, and then takes a year to do the strategy. We're sitting in halfway through 2026, and we've lost half a decade of of, uh, of action. And so, I, su I suppose my, my question is around: Are, are there e yeah, are there easier ways or um, to incorporate some of these things in the CEE bill into, say, environment legislation, the agriculture bill, the climate change act, the carbon budget, whatever? Yeah. Um, question one, um, and and or, or alternatively, actually, isn't this what we really need? Is the actual actions, not not another strategy paper, right? We we need the government to actually do the things like stopping fossil fuels, and um, you know switching us to electric vehicles, and just doing the regulation and the boring bits that the transport policy needs to do and whatever. Um, Kind of rather, rather than an overarching thing, which is what the bill asks for. So sort of two questions there. Yeah, thank you. So our campaign is actually, I uh, might have misled you before when I was talking about the Climate Change Act, our campaign is two years. So we've got a target of two years to get this made into law. Um, and um, in terms of speed, and in terms of existing legislation, we are still encouraging people to fight for all these things. Um, and our campaign groups, this is one of the great things about the CE Bill Alliances and the regional ones, that's all still going on, campaigning, campaigning to get government to um, reduce um, the need for fossil, fossil fuels, stop building um, coal mines, stop airports. We are actively uh, supporting campaigns across the country with that. Uh, but nothing will happen um, in terms of our international agreements uh, unless we have this overarching legislation made, made law, this stronger legislation. Um, and the only way that we can act as nations together in relationships with one or another is to um, pass legislation such as this. So, of course, we are doing this in, in Great Britain, uh, in many ways, we are at the forefront of climate change uh, legislation. Kevin Anderson says we have better legislation than, for example, Sweden, who is very progressive. Um, the Dutch are um, also looking at this type of um, legislation. Um, we still need it, even that, although all of these things that you're talking about, all of this campaigning must go on as well. Uh, we can't sit around waiting for this legislation. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's not needed. And um, all of this campaigning, of course, and with the campaign uh, for our bill, it just serves to raise awareness all the time and to push MPs and policymakers into really believing that this is what is needed and this is what must happen, um, making people wake up to it every day. Um, you know, if you've got somebody out there screaming about the... Um, um, expansion of an airport, they'll also have a sign for the CE bill. That's, that's what's happening on the ground. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Have I, have I missed any bit of your question? Uh, no, I think it answers the question. Thank you. 
Okay. Has has Melanie dropped out again? Uh, maybe she has. Christina, you have your um hand up. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Thank you. I just wondered um, what um, the Climate Change Committee um, has said on your proposed bill. Do you have, um, have you had negotiations with them? Are they supportive of it? Uh, how does, how is that working? Yeah, so they don't say anything publicly. Um, I, so um, I can't tell you what their public um, position is, but I, our parliamentary team talk with the climate individuals on the climate change um, committee, and uh, we know what some of them think individually. Um, Chris Stark on Channel 4 News um, last week said that um, the government's going in the wrong direction, that there are huge contradictions. Um, he said to um, Krishna Murphy, Guru Murphy, um, that all the um, expansion of airports, um, new licenses for um, fossil fuels um, and coal mines are evidence of us going in the wrong direction and evidence of no clear plan. So we, it's very clear what they think. Um, when they talk publicly in news, but they haven't got a position on our bill. We are going to, we have got a letter that we're writing them to talk to them about um, 1.5 and 2050. So that's, that's gonna be going out to them soon. Um, they might come out in favor. Thank you. I'm sorry, I dropped out again. And Ruth, um, you, you might have to do a bit of that because something's going uh, wrong at my end is there are there any other questions because we've got probably time for one more there's some very interesting ones in the chat um yes um Rachie about a briefing in the chat Ruth people have been asking for the latest briefing I'll just pop that in there oh, okay thanks thank you um, very much Rachie um, asked a good one about um how can we turn this into a something about morals or spiritual rather than I can't remember yeah. how, how can we make the bill a matter of morality yeah negotiable yeah. and spiritually sexy for churches yeah um do you know we were talking about this I was talking about this with my partner just before I came on um I mean um in terms of your own campaigning um I mean I'm not a Christian I'm I'm atheist However, I was brought up a Christian and I was confirmed and I am so grateful for my Christian upbringing and for those um, values that it instilled. And um, you know, I think um, in terms of our secular society, there is a great um, drive to, um, for this secular society because it meets um, the needs of, of um, a particular ideology, I think, that this in this country and in the Western developed nations that we've kind of leaned to, and that is um, that we do everything in terms of business and that business knows best and that um, our economy is the thing that we need to keep focusing on. But those ideals that most of us probably have been brought up with are... Um, ideals of um, thinking of others before you think of yourself um, and um, thinking of your neighbor, thinking of our place in the world as in terms of um, a developed nation. How can we think in terms of um, undeveloped nations, um, you know, the moral compass there. So I think it's very clear um, how this can be seen um, uh, using our bill as a vehicle that we have been consuming and consuming and consuming for years, for decades. At huge, it, you know, it started where, you know, hundreds of years ago, well, a couple of hundred years ago, 
um, our consumption and, the, and our, how brilliant we were at creating this economy around our consumption. And um, the UK, people in the UK, together with people in the uni United States, um, have made um, a complete economy out of this, a way of life, a culture, um, and that's spread throughout the world. And so for me, um, I think we've got a duty to change that around to show that there could be a better way of living. And that's what our Alliance, Alliance is about. It's about collecting groups of people who think in this way um, in terms of a different way of, of living and working and earning a living. And that's what we're doing with businesses. So we've now got some fantastic businesses coming on board who work within the circular economy. And Kate Rayworth, who invented donor economics, she's one of our supporters. Um, and she demonstrates um, and is demonstrating with countries and with municipalities and cities around the world that there is a different way of living and working that is viable. I so, think that, yeah. that, 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 that um, really, I, I, we probably have time for one more question, but it, it's probably important for us to say that we've got a couple of sessions that Ruth will tell you about and Barbara will tell you about shortly that will enable us to unpack that a little bit more. But I'm going to take one last question from Nicola um, and then we'll come to a close. Hello, yeah, we're uh, from rugby and our Green Christian group only just started. Our MP is not a climate change denier and he's joined in um, groups with Friends of the Earth before, but I'm just trying to work out when is the best time to engage with him? Um, I think the Climate Bill Alliance have emailed this week to say, can we email our MPs this week? But I just want to get it right because I email him a lot about <laughs> other things. So um, can you advise on that and a template or anything like that, please? Um, sorry, are you asking a question about the timing or how to yeah. do it? Yes, because I think, I mean, hasn't it, hasn't Caroline Lucas got an amendment she wants that she wants to get it in the Queen's speech or something? And, uh, yes, she does. So there is, there is, um, now is a good time. Um, I mean, I think it's always a good time. It, it, it's not so much the uh, engaging with MPs hasn't got so much to do with um, the progress of the bill, you know, in, in terms of that political or parliamentary uh, timetable. Uh, engaging with MPs can go on at any time, really, to talk to them about the concepts of the bill. But now is a very good time, but yeah, because of that amendment that Caroline's trying to get through to get the bill uh, put into the Queen's speech. So it's not gonna to go to a second reading at the moment then, automatically? No, no. no. Um, it's fallen along with all other legislation and it will come back in the next session. So all other legislation that hasn't been passed falls at the end of the parliamentary session and then it's all um, retabled, if that's what people want to do with it, at the next session. But in terms of um, talking to MPs, it's never a, the wrong time, I don't think. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Jane, the, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. The, the, the new session has just begun. Uh, would you do, just like to kind of pull everything together? And I think you've spoken a little bit about this. What can we do to help you? Yeah, sorry, the new session hasn't just begun. It's not, it's not, it, we think it's probably going to begin um, June, so halfway through June. Um, but to help really um, spread the word and um, galvanise people, encourage people to group together to, I think, strengthen numbers and strengthen diversity. So talking to different groups or groups that within your faith community, there are so many different groups, aren't there, even within one community, but really diversity is the thing and getting people, although they might be like-minded, from different backgrounds to come and, and, and ask MPs um, because it shows then the breadth of, um, the demand for change, that it's not just come, coming from one section like green groups or, you know, or left groups, it's coming from all sections of society. So people in the Women's Institute, people in business, people that work in um, environmentalists, teachers, lawyers, 
um, anybody you can get your hands on um, to to talk to, to say, to tell them that this is an opportunity um, for change and it's all encompassing. Um, you know, we're all in the same boat. So it, it's not an argument and we're completely apolitical. Uh, we're not um, aligned to any political party. Um, and kind of encouraging cross party discussion that can be a way of, of going to, or perhaps talking to a friend who um, has a different MP, perhaps a Lib Dem or a Labour MP, and asking, would the Conservative MP in a, in a neighbouring constituency come and talk to them as well with a group? So in this way, it kind of helps us unify and it gives support to, um, individuals you know it's hard it's hard just writing to your MP and getting rebuffed all the time and it, it's it helps if you've got support around you and others are doing it with you so it can mean um, getting um, having letters written by a number of signatories Brilliant. there's lots of resources available and Ruth's put them in the chat on the Green Christian website um, and uh, I just want to say thank you Jane for really, really uh, helping us to understand this. And um, maybe we can have another session on it when you know what's coming. Uh, yeah, in, yeah. To come. Um, I, think, I think, sorry to interrupt, I think what might be really useful is um, to have a look at the website and there are share, what we call share sessions. If you go along to one of those, they are probably more value, valuable than me just talking at you like this because they are um, groups of people that are all campaigning together and they swap ideas um, and they're great. This share, the the um, grassroots share events, they're on the website and you can sign up to them. They happen every week. Excellent. I'm going to now just uh, hand over to Ruth and then to Barbara. Ruth will tell you about uh, what CCA have got planned. And she's got a couple of slides about CCA's plans and about um, Green Christian's plans. And then I think Barbara is going to help us close in prayer. Uh, I'm sorry we've run over. Uh, Jane, could you just put the website uh, in the chat in case anyone hasn't come across it? And I wanted to say a big thank you to the people who have been answering questions in the chat. So I think Ben and Caroline have done a wonderful job of fielding some of those, those questions. So thank you. And Ruth, okay. slide, maybe. I'll be as quick as I can. I just had to share this um, with people. Um, I just noticed they... Uh, Oh, what am I doing? I always click share, but I don't mean share. I mean present. There we go. Um, well, I just saw this um, uh, this morning in the Bible. Pray to God so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. I think that's a really good thing to um, keep in mind for all of us um, that are just trying to live. It's more, more discipleship than um, discipleship is more important than success, even though, of course, we can pray and want work for success. Uh, okay, Green Christian events. There's two Green Christian events coming up. Um, most importantly, this coming Wednesday, it's just seven till eight. It's always on time. It never runs over, does it, Barbara? And, um, and it's the CE bill again, but it's what is it, what is it about and how can you do something about it? So it's much more about campaigning and what we're actually going to do about it. So do come to that. Um, there's, there's so much in there that I mean, I've been looking at this for a long time, but it's really good to, to make sure you know what you can do to help. And then Thursday, 24th of June is the launch of our Join Enough Plenty, which is a small group discussion resource for churches on the economic drivers for the current ecological crisis. So um, it's a really good, um, it, we've got Eve Poole talking and other people um, talking about that. So please do, do come to that. All the information is on our website. Um, CCA regular events, I think most people know that about them. We've got morning prayer, evening prayer, some days of the week, Saturday sessions, this time every, every Saturday, and a new to CCA event every two months or so. Um, the Saturday sessions coming up are we've got CE Bill again, which much more, which we much more um, sort of getting ideas from people and much more discussion next week. 
and more on perhaps civil disobedience, direct action, how that might fit into the CE bill. Um, uh, the following one is how to get involved with G7. There's a general meeting every month and then the 12th of June will be just praying for the G7. A lot of people, a lot of us will be down in Carvis Bay. And then the next two are about why go to prison from a Christian perspective. Um, actions that are happening. There's this every Wednesday, every Wednesday outside parliament. Um, it's the Faith Bridge, the Christian Climate Action and the Faith Bridge are praying outside parliament between 11 and four. And this is the most important thing I want to let you know about. Um, the Church of England still has um, investments in Shell. And on the day of the Shell AGM, this coming Tuesday at um, 10 o'clock, there will be a vigil. If you want to come and get involved with it, please come at 8.30 and meet at the Wash House opposite the Church House modern entrance. And um, we just feel this is something we have to do. And please come and join us. It will be a prayer and um, street theatre. And then the 26th of May, the following week, we plan to do something else for Exxon, for the AGM, because can you believe it, the Church of England still has investments in Exxon. It is really true and it needs to stop. Um, and then G7, Carbis Bay, there's a um, there's actions in London the week before. There's um, a beautiful pilgrimage along the top here from Newquay down to Carbis Bay and there will be vigils and small actions, probably mostly simply just sitting on the road and praying um, in Carvis Bay during the G7. So please have a look at the website and get in touch if you want to get involved. And then actions coming up. The July Synod is no longer in York, which is such a shame. It's now in London. How boring is that? Um, but there may be some actions, some sort of vigil outside during that. Earthfast is happening instead of Greenbelt on the 8th on the 28th of August and people are walking to COP starting on the 5th of September. Thank you. I think that's that's it. Thank you. How do I get out of here? Stop thank you, Ruth. Um, we've overrun rather. So thank you to everybody who stayed. Barbara, I'm going to hand over to you to tell us a little bit more about the Green Christian stuff on this and to maybe close in prayer. Uh, just Green Christian is very happy to have been here today with CCA. The Green Christian also supports the CEE bill and we're doing all we can for that. I'd end with prayer. Back in February, we asked our members to write prayers for the Show the Love campaign. So I'm going to end with a blessing from the Ashvale Chapel Poetry Group. So let's pray. May our loving God, who created the world and all that is in it, inspire us to delight in our beautiful home and to live in wonder, peace, and joy. May our living God keep our hearts turned to loving our neighbor and to respecting the creation we share. May our merciful God help us to live this week in goodness and hope and fill us with God's peace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.